Um, we have uh, from text Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. We're going to be entering into this word. Before we do, I want to just remind and set up uh, tonight um, in the next 20, 25 minutes as I share the message. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. And, and if I've left something out or I didn't prepare, I, I, I pray that what I've missed in my preparation, what I've missed in my devotion, that the Holy Spirit would unlock and speak to each and every one of us. Um, when we did 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, everyone is a new creation. If the devil or the enemy or your friends or someone from the from the past wants to come and say, hey, you used to be this way. I know, but I've changed. Hey, you used to react this way. I know, but I've changed. I've become a new creation. And each day you need to remind yourself, I have a new chapter in my life. I have a new destiny in my life. I have a new me in my life because Christ is in my life. We've been fasting and many of us, pretty much all of us, have been fasting the last two weeks. We're entering into the last week of Daniel fast. And it's been a sacrifice. Some of you have had headache, headaches. Some of you have been a little bit ill. Some of you have been um, just kind of attacked spiritually. You feel, but I'm telling you, if you stay the course, my God who is faithful shall supply all your needs. Hallelujah to Jesus. I want to read Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Just one verse and then we'll enter the text. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 from the New King James Version says it this way. You are the salt of the earth. Can you say those yellow words with me? Ready? You, are the salt of the earth. as a believer in Jesus Christ, Jesus says to his disciples, you. And he says, but if the salt loses its flavor, how, can, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. I'm going to read quickly in quoting the Lescu version. Voi suntet sadea pământul. Let's say it all together. Voi, da dacă sarea își perde gustul, prin ce își va căpăta iarăși puterea de a sărea. Um, I want to tell you that uh, if you look around in the days and the culture that's surrounding, I have children in high school, I have a child in middle school, and I have a child in elementary school. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you this by the word of God. Do not wait or expect for the world to change. Do not wait for the world or for the culture around you, fie in Romania, fie in America, wherever you might be, to change and all of a sudden become good. All of a sudden, not like the darkness. All of a sudden, pull back and say, hey, we just don't like sin anymore. Because the Bible says that ain't going to happen. The Bible says that you're the salt of the earth. That you're the light of the world. And what I've come tonight to say to you is that salt cannot lose its saltiness. God has called us to give the world flavor. Not for anybody else, but for Him. Oh, I'm jumping around tonight. I'm sorry. But we can't world, wait for the world to change. So I want to talk about two things in relation of salt and what it does. And as you guys walk out tonight, I hope you grab one of those shakers before everybody else grabs them. And I want you to remember spiritually that salt is so important. And God calls you salt of the earth. Number one, salt gives... Come on, we're going to interact tonight. Salt gives... You ever try to eat tomatoes? My, my daughter, Ava, loves tomatoes. But she almost never eats it without salt. It, it doesn't taste right. It doesn't taste good. Um, more importantly, like for example, potatoes. Mashed potatoes, a baked potato. You, does anybody eat a baked potato without putting some? I, I can't imagine. It gives it flavor. Um, the Bible says that as Christians, our function is to give flavor to the earth. Give flavor to the, the one who enjoys the flavor is not the earth. The one who enjoys the flavor is God. The Bible says that our presence on earth makes earth acceptable to God. That when God looks upon earth, all of a sudden it becomes acceptable to Him because of your presence, because of your family's presence. Because when we gather together, the presence of God's saints, all of a sudden, He doesn't see the rest of the world. He sees His children. He sees His nation, His people. So our presence makes earth acceptable to God. The second is our presence commends the earth to God's mercy. The Bible says it this way, that you can show kindness. God is showing us kindness even though we deserve punishment. Every lie you've said... Every movie that you've looked at that you weren't supposed to, every image that you've, as a male, as a female, that you've, that you've uh, stored in your brain, 
every gossip, every word of hatred you said. You did not deserve mercy, but God has given you mercy. And because of God's people, the gathering of the saints, God says earth is acceptable because of the salt of the earth. Adika, in other words, you and me, as children of God. Third, our presence is why God's grace extends to the earth. That means He gives favor. He lets the sun shine on the just and the unjust each and every morning, that the presence of God's people on this earth brings the mercy and the grace of God upon this nation, upon this globe, upon the nation of Romania, upon the nation of France. It is because of God's people that the flavor, the salt of the earth is acceptable unto God. In Genesis chapter 18 verses 16 through 33, we see this principle verse after verse after verse after verse. You see the man of God, Abraham, and he says it this way. He says, God, I know Sodom and Gomorrah is evil. I know Sodom and Gomorrah is full of sin. I know Sodom and Gomorrah are sacrificing their children. I know Sodom and Gomorrah is a wicked generation. I know Sodom and Gomorrah is full of evil. But if you find 50 people... If you find the presence of your salt, if you find the presence of your people, if you just find 50 in a, in, a, in a city full of thousands and thousands of people, if you find 50, will you destroy the whole city? God says, no. If I have my people, if I have my salt, if I have the presence of my people in that city, 50, I will restrain my wrath. And then there's this negotiation. He goes, what about 45? What about 40? What about 30? What about 20? And he goes all the way down to 10. But God, if you find 10, 10 righteous in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, will you restrain? Will you pull back your wrath? Will you show them favor? He says, if I find 10 righteous, I will restrain. I will pull back the wrath of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, God calls us ambassadors. Everybody say ambassadors. Uh, now then, if we are ambassadors for Christ, and I want you to think about what an ambassador is. An ambassador, and many of you have heard this text, this verse, ambassador is, is not there because of what he thinks is the opinion that what should happen in that country, right? Um, when President Obama was president, he sent ambassadors to different countries. When... Um, when uh, President Trump and President Biden became presidents, they sent ambassadors to China, ambassadors to Russia, ambassadors to different countries, to Israel. And when those ambassadors would come, they wouldn't say their opinion, right? Right? Whose opinion would they say? The, the presidents, the United States government. Because the government, the, the government of, of the United States sent me, I am now um, puternichit, I am now speaking on behalf of the U.S. government. Not my words, but their words. We get so troubled and we make so many mistakes when we want to be, we want to be uh, looked upon really good by culture. We want to be accepted by different people. We want to be accepted by our friends. And we depart from the word of God because it's inconvenient. We are no longer, listen, ambassadors when I spay my opinion and not the word of God. Amen. That's good preaching. Hallelujah. Amen. That's good preaching. When we all of a sudden take ourselves out of alignment with the Word of God, the Word of God says, that's you. That ain't me. That's you doing your own thing. That's you doing you. But that's not the presence of God. God calls us ambassadors. In 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, in Philippians chapter 3 verse 20, He says it this way, For we have a citizenship in heaven. Cetetenia nuestra este en cerur. That means we belong, okay, I've, I've, I've become a citizen of the U.S. I have a, a blue passport, right? Um, I become, I now have the rights, the full rights of a citizen. Uh, some of us were born in Romania. We were old enough and of age to get the, um, what color is the passport? Like a maron or, right? It, a, a Romanian passport. We now have the full rights. We can travel. We have a passport. And the Bible says that we are citizens not of this earthly country, but of a heavenly country. We, we are citizens of there. And as ambassadors, we need to give flavor. Now, I want you to think about ambassadors. Our position on this earth is representing heaven's government. Amen? Amen? We have no authority. I'm going to say it again. We have no authority to act on our own. 
When you act on your own, you're doing you. You're not doing God. You're not, you're not representing the Lord. You're not representing the Holy Spirit. That's you going astray. We have no authority to act on our own. We obey directions. And when we obey directions, I can tell you the promises of God are yes and amen. You have the entire authority by Jesus Christ behind you. You have the entire government of heaven supporting every word and every deed, every action that you make. Hallelujah. Now, when we give flavor, I want you to think about this. Before one government, I want you to think both spiritually and naturally, in the, the supernatural, the spiritual, and the natural. Before one government declares war on another, the final warning is to withdraw its ambassadors. Salt. You are the salt of the earth. And God says before, and I'll show you in scripture, before the final, before the wrath of God comes, before judgment comes, I'm going to withdraw my people as a final warning. A few days, <laughs> this is so interesting, Saturday morning yesterday, I woke up and I had little notifications. The United States is starting to pull out all diplomats. This is real. From the country of Ukraine. Ambassadors, diplomats, representatives, officials. You can see them on CNN, Fox News, AP Today, day after the last two days. This is a, a picture. And some of you are like, okay, it's Ukraine, David. What does that have to do with me? I can see Romania right there. You see it? It's right there. Oh, I pray for our nation. Amen. I pray for Romania. Amen. Salt gives favor. In, in the Old Testament, we see two examples that I'm going to give you. In the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, God said, I'm going to send my judgment. I'm going to send my judgment. Before I send my judgment, I'm going to take care of my people. I'm going to pull out my ambassadors. I'm going to pull out my family, my ambassadors. And he tells Noah to build an ark. Year after year after year, he tells them the wrath of judgment, judgment is coming. And then later on, like I said in Genesis chapter 18, in the days of Lot, the wrath of God cannot start until the people of God are separate and are protected by God. In the New Testament, we see the rapture of the church. God says, when I take my church, when I take my church, then the wrath of God will, will come down. The second use of salt in relation to food is salt restrains, and I've kind of alluded to this, corruption. It prevents decay, if you will. Uh, long, long, and long ago, the Roman soldiers used to not be paid by, paid by coins. They used to be paid by salt. That's why we get the phrase, you're not worth your weight in salt. You ever heard that phrase? You're not worth the weight in salt because they were paid by salt because salt preserves our presence as ambassadors of Christ, it doesn't abolish corruption. I want to tell you that we will never stop wicked and evil. Each day, God says to take up your cross and to follow me. Your life is a witness to this world. Your life is a witness to neighbors and to friends, to co-workers, to accept Christ. And if they don't, that's not on you. That's on them. That's their choice. But it doesn't abolish corruption. We can only hold it in check long enough and then the purpose of grace and God's mercy comes to fully worked out. As I was reading, as I was preparing, I want to go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. Go to the second part. But if the salt loses its flavor. If the salt goes bad. Daca seara its pierde... Gustul, zice Cornilescu. Um, as I was preparing, um, I was looking, what are signs? <laughs> how, how does God confront his people when pierde gustul? When their passion has waxed cold. Zice fratele Micha, voi găsi eu credință? Will I find faith when I return? 
Will your passion, your love for Christ, just because it's not convenient, just because some of your friends, you know, they want to do other things on Sunday, all of a sudden you're not 25 years old, you're 30, you're 35, I've matured, I don't need to be as passionate about Christ and what God means to me anymore. If your love, if you've pierde your gustul, gustul, if you've lost your flavor, um, and, I, and I said, God, how do, you confront, how do you confront people? And as I was studying, I saw what are signs, these are four signs of a confrontational person. And, I, and it was very interesting to me. This was online in 2018, a magazine, one of the culture magazines. And they say, these are four signs of a person being confrontational. Number one, they're very commanding. And I started laughing. You know why? We have the 10 commandments. <laughs> you see it? Oh, they're very, God can be very commanding. Yes. That is his nature. That's who God is. Well, you're very confrontational, Mr. Christian. You're very confrontational, Mrs. Christian. Well, yes, that's who God is. He's going to tell you the truth. He's going to confront you. The second thing that I, uh, that I was, uh, so, was so very interesting to me is a confrontational person, a sign is they're very direct. They're very too honest. God says my spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is going to be the spirit of the spirit of truth. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to always tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you when you're going good. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you favor. But when you slip, I'm going to confront you. And I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm going to come before you. The third sign that um, a confrontational purpose ha a person has, he makes you feel uncomfortable. Some of you tonight are not comfortable. I wanted to hear Pastor David. I wanted to hear a message that made me feel good. I wanted lukewarm Christianity. I wanted Kumziche Pastor Hagin. I wanted to be in a, in, a, in a soak bathtub of Christianity that's comfortable and doesn't make me move and doesn't challenge me and doesn't push me and doesn't say get closer to God, doesn't draw me deeper to God. Makes you uncomfortable. God will always, will always, listen, and, I, and I've experienced this, He will always move your comfort because he's working on your character. He will always challenge you in your comfort because he's working on your character. And the fourth sign uh, of a confrontational person, they see things as black and white. Let your yes be and let your no be. Sin is sin. Right? God he, uh, condemns the world in the book of, uh, I think it's Isaiah, when he says they say bad to good and good to bad. They got it inverse. They got it upside down. And, and, and one of the things that I was preparing, when you need to know that when you are salt of the earth, you need to know you're going to be confrontational. And some of you are not comfortable with that. And God is saying, this is not comfort, this is confront. That sometimes you're going to have to tell evil it's evil. And sin that it's sin, and good that it's good. And God is calling to you sometimes, some ways, some people do not like confrontation. Amen. <laughs> some people don't, they're uncomfortable. No, frau, so much. No, and God's not calling such that chits. But God is saying, salt gives flavor. Salt prevents corruption, prevents decay. And salt will be, listen, confrontational. And I'm going to take you to the Old Testament. And I'm going to take you to the New Testament. Psalm chapter 50, verse 16. I'm reading from the New King James Version. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you? To declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth. Seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. When you saw a thief, you consented. You agreed with the thief. And have been a partaker of adulterers. Well, you've been a she website to Allah, man. It's okay. Don't yet. That website, that's good. You give your mouth to evil. You curse. Right? And your tongue frames deceits full of lies. Verse 18. You sit and speak against your brother. How many churches are filled with people, members, deacons, preachers, dads, moms, and they speak evil against their brother? You slander your own mother's... with the you speak evil and you, 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 you slander your own mother's son. Verse 21. When you do such things, and I'm, I'm preaching to myself. I'm not looking at any. I'm preaching. When you do these things, should I stay silent? 
You may have thought I was just like you, the Bible says, but I will rebuke you and indict you behind your back, around the corner, on an on a Instagram post. No, uh, on a random burner account on Facebook. You know, <laughs> those, those burner accounts, you have them on China. You have a burner account on Facebook, you know what I'm talking about. And then, no, God says to your face. God's confrontational. In the very next chapter, chapter 51, this is the chapter King David wrote. Before you read verse 1, you know what it says in the, in the subtitles? Romanesh, the English, whatever you want in the Hebrew. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him. Didn't go to the newspapers. Didn't go behind him. No, came to him after he had sinned with Bathsheba. God is going to confront you. God is going to confront you. God is going to confront you. In the New Testament, Jesus says it this way. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, do te la comitet. <laughs> if your brother sins against you, do te la dara de seama. If your brother sins against you, make sure everybody on your little text group knows. No. It says go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Confront him. Confront him. If he hears you, you have gained a brother. Chuck Swindoll said this, says it this way. If we confront someone, we should have one goal in mind. Restoration, not embarrassment. Restoration, not embarrassment. So that's Jesus. That's the Old Testament. Let's go. What does the Holy Spirit do? John chapter 16, verse 8. And when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict. He will confront he will he's going to confront the world of sin, uh, in verse 9, of sin because they do not believe in me. God is confrontational. If I want you to learn something tonight, that you being salt, you being the salt of the earth that gives flavor so that God, when he sees the earth, he sees his people and he finds mercy and he gives grace and he gives the presence of God's people, gives that flavor, that God will confront you about your sins. That he wants you to change. Uh, nothing is more evident than Luke chapter 14. You want to read a chapter about confrontation? Open up to Luke chapter 14. This is when Jesus goes into the house of a Pharisee. He goes and sits down and he is not a very polite guest. He says, number one, you're a hypocrite religiously. You invite people that can invite you back. You invite your brother, you invite your sister... You invite your parents, you invite your cousins, you invite your friends. But you don't invite other people who can never repay you back. That's verses 1 through 6. If you keep going, he then he, then he talks about selfish pride. Mandria. And then I, I'm trying to go quick. <laughs> I've gone too, much, too long. Uh, and then he says using people. He confronts when you're religious. He confronts when you're full of mandria. He confronts when you use people. Instead of loving them, he confronts. He confronts. Proverbs chapter 27, 5 says it this way. Mai bine o mustrare pe față decât o prietenie ascunsă. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Come back to what we've been doing the last two weeks. We've been fasting. We've been praying. And I want to tell you a couple of things. Number one, um, Matthew chapter 6 talks about these three things. When you give, when you pray, and when you fast. Not if, but when. I want you to say that with me. When you give, when you pray, and when you fast. One more time. When you give, when you pray, and when you fast. And I saw something this year. I've read this text many times. I've never seen before. In, um, in the original language, when you give is singular. When you give is singular. Can die, it's sing. Other people don't need to know. Between you and God, you want to give. But when you pray, in verse 6, it talks about singular. In verse 7, it talks about collectively. Let's pray together. 
Trimitem text mesaj. Ne rugăm pentru sora Rodica. Ne rugăm pentru familia cu tare. Ne rugăm pentru uh, the, the son who's, who's, who's been a, who's just away from home. We're, we're praying for this family that needs restoration. And, and we pray. We pray in your camarutza, but then we pray as a church. And then it's very interesting because, I'm sorry, verse 17 and 16 says it the same way. It says, when you fast by yourself, but then when you fast collectively. And I, and I want to point one thing out. Stefan, if you can come help me, D major. I want to point one thing out. When you pray, and he says in, um, I want to read you this text. When you pray, and he gives the example in um, Luke chapter 18. And I'm going to read, I'm going to read verse 4 and verse 5. Um, Jesus told this parable to impress on his disciples that they must always keep praying. Keep praying. That's the objective. Keep praying and not to lose heart. And he talks about a woman who came and kept bothering him, kept persisting. I'm going to read verse 4. For a long time, this judge refused, but after a while, he said to himself, I don't fear God. I don't respect other people. But because this widow keeps bothering me, everybody say bother, bother me, I will see to it that she gets justice. Otherwise, she'll keep coming and pestering me and wear me out. You see it? Bothering me, keep coming, pestering me, and wears me out. And this week I was, I was saying, God, okay, what does that mean in prayer? You know what that means? If you're not persistent, this is someone, I'm preaching to you prophetically, someone right now. If you're not persistent in your prayer, you're not doing it right. We have teachers across America in, in pulpits and preachers that come before you and say, pray it and claim it. In Jesus' name, amen. She knew my I pray it and I claim it. But Jesus says, here's the example. Here's the example to keep praying. Here's the example. You keep persisting. You keep saying, God, God, come alongside with me. God, I'm not giving up. God, I'm going to prayer nights. God, I'm taking another day of fast. I'm going to keep persisting. I'm not just going to claim it, but I'm going to keep praying. And it felt so strong in my, my heart, in my mind, in my personal life. If you are not persisting in your prayer, listen. God is speaking to you. You're not doing it right. Keep persisting. God is speaking to you. Keep persisting. It will be done. Holy Spirit is speaking to you to be salt to give flavor that God yes he'll bless you but sometimes he's going to pull you he's going to say I'm confronting you about this confrontational 